Welcome. The topic for today's workshop is Bridging Student Leadership in School Crisis Recovery and Renewal. And the, the presenters are Jen Leland and Darren Green. You're really fortunate to hear from these two. Um, both of them have a really extensive background in training and supporting institutions, um, child serving institutions in trauma informed services and practices. And they bring that to their work. And today their, their talk will include um, these skills to help in crises, which I know we're all seeing uh, much more than we would like to, and, um, and also bringing youth voice to that. And so um, I know we're going to learn a lot about how to bridge those um, critical responses to be transformative and healing and supportive. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping tips as folks arrive. There's a chat box. There's a Q&A box. Please feel free to enter questions as you think of them. Um, Darren and Jen will take some questions as they go, and they're going to have some interactive um, questions for you uh, to respond in the chat. And then they've left, they'll leave about 10 minutes at the end for more Q&A. So welcome, and I'll turn it over to the great team. Great. Thank you, Tracy. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming to our workshop. Just inviting everyone, I know it's like lunchtime, mealtime, if you'll join me in a stretch, if that feels good to you, just sort of taking a breath, arriving in this moment for this workshop. Giving some love to our Zoom shoulders that hold up our heads and just sending out appreciation for everyone and the conference hostesses with the hostesses um, for putting on this lovely convening. So my name is Jen Leland, she, her pronouns, and I am showing up with my colleague um, and friend, Darren Green. We both wear many hats. Um, we both work for Trauma Transformed, but today we are really showing up as as partners for the School Crisis Recovery and Renewal Project, which we will get into a little bit here in a second. And next slide, please. And so again, just happy to be part of this in this ongoing discussion about resilience. We always like to say, at Trauma Transform that, you know, our young folks, the young folks, students, young folks, community members, residents, we all show up resilient. And so we really want to lean into this conversation about how to grow resilience, not for other people, but for our systems, our school communities, right? So how do we show up um, and embody and embed more resilience in our systems? And so a little bit about our school crisis and recovery, pro recovery and renewal project team. Um, this is a collaborative effort. It's a SAMHSA led grant between the Center for Applied Research Solutions, CARS, Trauma Transformed, and strongly informed with partnership from the National Center for School Crisis Bereavement and our end funded by SAMHSA, also part of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. So all the many partners sending out appreciation and love to all the many partners um, that are in this inquiry process with us and now with all of you around what does it mean for school communities to not only get ready for and respond to but more deeply recover and renew after a school crisis, during a school crisis. And so today we're gonna to be focusing on how do we engage, build, support, avoid pitfalls, um, and benefit from the immense wisdom that students have um, in learning and growing and recovering and renewing with us um, around school crisis. Next slide, please. So this is our lovely disclaimer slide. So very briefly, these are our views. Um, we're constantly learning with you all, with students, with educators, with folks impacted by all the many layers of trauma and with folks also on the healing journey with us. Um, this is our views. They don't necessarily reflect the views of the host, the conference hosts or SAMHSA. Next slide.
And so I was able to introduce myself a little bit. I just want to give it over to Darren, um, my colleague, who will be co-hosting and leading this workshop with us today to introduce himself. Excellent. Well, good, good afternoon, everyone. And I'm so grateful to, to be here with you all. Uh, my name is Darren Green. I'm an SCRR field coach. And um, working with the SCRR project, in addition to that, I'm, I'm a community consultant trainer and facilitator that's been working uh, with Trauma Transformed since 2018. Um, though I've been partnering with the Child Welfare and other youth serving professionals, both in the public and in the nonprofit sector, for over half of my life. Um, I was a former foster, I was in foster care as a young person and had a really amazing opportunity to be deeply involved in several youth empowerment organizations. It really helped me um, as a young person with, uh, really improve the, uh, the systems that I was a part of. It helped me recognize voice of choice, build powerful skill in order to make change in the world around me, not only in the systems, but also in my community. Um, the Youth Adult Partnership, which we'll talk more about, uh, was an incredibly healing experience for me and my peers, and really helped uh, me personally guide and discover um, my career. Um, I transitioned to being a staff person working for Youth and Time Organization about 10 years ago, or rather for 10 years for one of the organizations I was part of, doing a lot of community organizing and training. And I um, also served on nonprofit governing and advisory board as a youth. But now uh, I provide the training consultation, facilitation, and coaching for different organizations that work to empower both youth and adults to uh, develop skills and opportunities to improve the system. So I'm really grateful to be uh, here. We'll be weaving in some of our personal experiences and knowledge as it applies to the concepts that we're sharing. So thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Darren. I just invited folks who are with us today. Um, if you feel so inclined, drop your name, where you're Zooming in from. Actually, this isn't Zoom. Where you are feed looping in from um, into the chat. Anything else you want to say just to arrive with us? And next slide. So a little bit about what is SCRR. These are the hats we're showing up with. Um, SCRR is really a group of folks, educators, uh, school people with histories in school-based therapy, support positions, leaders, scholars, um, former students, right? All of us, everybody coming together in this deep inquiry of co-designing and constructing meaningful practices that don't just look at how we get ready for a crisis, so crisis readiness, or how we respond to a crisis, but really how we create the cultures, the conditions that we need in our school communities to help us recover and ultimately renew. Um, and then again, that school crisis readiness is essential, response is critical, and, 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 what happens after matters too. Um, giving ourselves the space and grace, the cultures and conditions um, to deepen into our recovery and our renewal or even our post-traumatic growth. Next slide. And I'm seeing the chats too. Welcome Derek Elder. Thank you for joining us. Welcome Tracy. Thank you for those that are putting your names into the chat. We welcome you, Selena Moore. Good afternoon, thank you. So this slide here, um, we do our work, I, I love this metaphor. This is about you know the work being, we often say this in our trauma-informed work, that trauma-informed work is both about the landscape and the mirror, right? So the landscape, what we do in the world, so in classrooms, that may be the practices, the instructional interventions, what we do out in the classroom, what we do in our clinics, what we do in our organizations, in community, as providers, as educators, as leaders. And then there's also the mirror work, this both and work, that when we think about even just consider student leadership, 
thinking about what stories about students or young folks might we need to transform that we carry, right? Or detox from in order to deeply listen, deeply partner with, deeply be led by. So always thinking in terms of what needs healing and transformation inside of me in order to sustain transformation and healing in my classroom, school, clinic, organization. So I just put that question out just as an offering today to carry with you throughout the workshop that we're going to be toggling between sort of thinking about practices for engaging, being led by students. Um, we're also going to be talking about some of the possibilities and pitfalls that come with that. And really, we're going to be inviting us all into this learning and transformational journey about what do we, how do we need to transform, grow, evolve um, as adults in the systems that we're in, in order to more deeply uh, partner with youth. Um, so again, if you want to drop some thoughts in the chat at any time, um, maybe in response to this reflective question, that would be lovely, no requirement, but I do offer for us to kind of hold this as we go through this workshop. Um, and hopefully our hope is that, you know, we are learning and growing with you and we are always and forever engaging with this reflection question, always and forever engaging in some level of loving interrogation of ourself and our systems so that we can create the kinds of school communities that don't even need any more workshops about engaging with student leadership, right? That it's just become so much embedded into the DNA of how we operate. Um, so next slide, please. And here's our objectives for this workshop today. Um, we're going to define very briefly kind of school crisis, readiness, response, recovery, and renewal. Like I said earlier, we're going to talk a little bit about common pitfalls, promises, possibilities when partnering with youth leaders in crisis recovery with a special attention to some of that mirror work. Um, what, do, what might we need to engage in? Um, what skills do adults need to build? Um, and then just identifying a couple strategies that help and, and identifying and acknowledging um, some things that may harm when partnering with young people and students to define what recovery from a school crisis means for them and what it could look like. Um, we're going to present some resources into the chat as we go through this and we'll uh, have the I understand that some resources will be sent afterwards too. So those are our objectives today. I invite us to hold them lightly. Um, we also want to keep this informal. So Darren and I have agreed to um, kind of be in conversation as much as possible, be in conversation with each other and with you and let whatever needs to emerge, emerge as a conversation can, as conversational as we can be in this format recognizing that we may be all suffering from a little screen fatigue. So um, inviting us all to offer grace and space with tech issues, with this disembodied platform to stretch when you need to, to converse with us in the chat, to put in some Q&A. We will leave time at 1.30 um, to focus on Q&A. And we love, love, love Q&A. Um, so please, please, Please do that. Next slide, please. So this is the framework of our school crisis recovery and renewal project, partnership with CARS and SAMHSA uh, funded. So just want to go through this really quickly. You know, readiness. Um, this slide in particular is looking at the crisis that we are all in collectively right now with COVID, but we know that schools have been impacted by many types of crisis. Um, and we are not defining crisis for folks. Um, a crisis, the way we kind of define crisis, is a big thing that happens and that we invite school communities to really define that for themselves and to identify those things for themselves as crisis. Um, 
But readiness is, you know, how we prepare for crisis. Response is the immediacy, right? How we are responding in the immediate event during a crisis that is happening or maybe immediately following a crisis. And then we're looking at, especially through our SERR work, is recovery and renewal. So recovery, borrowing from Judith Herman's work around establishing safety and then also bringing some inquiry into that. Um, what are the different levels of safety? What does structural safety look like? What levels of safety are available and not available based on our positionality, our racial locations, um, our locations of privilege? Um, what are the structural supports necessary for safety and what are the structural, what are the structures that actually impede safety? Um, so again, some deep inquiry work around that and some practical kind of strategies. Um, looking at mourning, I've been holding this a lot lately just in terms of the pandemic grief and what it means for our schools to be grieving schools in a culture that is grief denying. Um, so how do we allow ourselves, our school communities to mourn, commemorate, memorialize after a loss, after crisis? to repair any ruptures that happened, and then to also celebrate, move into sort of celebration and honoring what we've learned, the legacies that have been built, or the legacies that may have been built by those we've lost. And then renewal is our sweet spot, right? Renewal is where we really, our project is a five-year project, so we are in the second year of that. And we really, this invitation is out to all school communities. We'll have resources at the end if you would like to partner with us or receive additional TA. But that is our, you know, that is our sweet spot where we really want to inquire into and co-design strategies for school communities to deepen into that post-traumatic growth that meaning making, that really moving from chaos to cohesion. Um, and just understanding that that renewal work is really where systems transformation lives. And what a beautiful, beautiful um, invitation for us all today to strengthen our ability to partner with students to lead that work. Because who better, who better in my experience in my school work days have been able to reimagine and push me to reimagine systems than young folks. They bring enormous wisdom, rigorous renewal inquiry work, rigorous analysis about how we might be able to reimagine our systems after we've all been through a big thing. And I just hold that in terms of COVID and sort of maybe some of the inquiry that's happening now after we are still in crisis response, still in a pandemic, but also beginning to consider what's happened to us, what's happening with us, and how might we reimagine what school safety looks like, what health looks like, what well-being looks like, what learning can look like, how we might imagine how our systems can transform, what we've learned, what we've been able to do, the resilience practices we've been able to embed at the systemic school level that we can sustain into our futures. Um, so next slide. Today we're going to be really focusing on student leadership in crisis recovery and renewal promises and pitfalls. I am going to turn this over to um, my colleague Darren Green, and then we will be in conversation with you all around what does that look like, sound like, feel like, what are the possibilities, what are the pitfalls, what are the skills we need to build as adults? Excellent. Thank you, Jen. Yeah. So in this section, we're going to spend more time exploring um, what are some of the things that are really essential to keep in mind when we're working toward creating a, a strong, deep, uh, youth, youth adult partnership and leadership development for youth. Um, we wanted to start off with a bit of a reflection question. Uh, just starting, just generally speaking, um, what does it, what does it mean to you? What does it mean to center the experiences and wisdom of those who have been impacted 
by crisis in the recovery of your life. So feel free to throw your ideas in the chat. Darren, it's Tracy. I just wanted to give you a quick reminder if you can um, talk a little bit more loudly. It's, um, the audio is a little faint. Thank you. I know it's not your comfort zone. <laughs> Thank you. So this question is really about helping folks think about what they can do to help prepare and intentionally plan on how they will engage with people. Um, so what does it mean, essentially, to I know for me, it, it means inviting folks to the table, it means supporting them, encouraging them uh, to engage, to participate, to lead. Uh, it means listening, uh, <laughs> not just listening to respond and offer support, but to listen and understand, to really understand what's happening and what their ideas are for change. And making sure that we're honoring their voice, sharing that, and elevating that. Into When we're focusing on um, recovery during the, uh, these two days, um, we offer the idea that youth leadership is really an opportunity to help attend to young people's ability to recover and renew after a big, a big crisis. Um, it's an opportunity for healing and growth. Um, Trauma Transforms uh, has a six uh, principle framework for uh, different things that you could, that are essential in order to create a trauma-informed healing system. And one of them that is key is collaboration and empowerment. As we recognize that um, when, a, when a young person is able to be self-determined or develop self-efficacy, um, they can begin to heal um, from, the, from the experience of trauma. When young people are involved in planning and development, when they are able to be the facilitators to help uh, engage in conversation, when they're able to help plan and organize, that these things can actually help uh, support their health and, and recovery. In order to recognize, or one of the reasons why this is so important is because when we look at this from a trauma lens, we recognize that trauma and all its forms really make us feel helpless and powerless because it actually overwhelms our brain and dysregulates us often. And when we also look at this from the lens of social cultural trauma, um, this also causes massive amounts of disempowerment for young people. And it's experienced in, uh, uh, individually and, sometimes, and often unequal, unequally. When we also think about the need for self-determination for young people, um, that young people, historically and currently in our world and many of our systems um, are often disempowered where they have very limited um, rights and agency. And so um, there's many things that we can do to actually help support them to uh, recognize what they, their, their voice and choice. It's important to keep in mind that every time that we disempower someone by taking away their voice and choice, we're potentially causing harm that could echo some of those other traumatic experiences they've had in their life. Also, whenever we disempower folks, we can actually create learned helplessness for young people, where they stop even having the hope that they're, they can make an impact, that they can uh, make a change in their life. And this undermines that efficacy. The good thing is that these things can be healed when we work towards doing things um, with young people in partnership. That we're not just doing things to and for them, but with them. We have this, um, one of the ways that we can develop a sense of agency for young people, help them develop it, is to really uh, move, create opportunities for them to do something. Um, one of the ways that we can decrease those positive, or those um, potentially harmful effects of trauma, 
um, is when we can actually do something to change the situation and the situation of others. And this can actually help um, reduce some of the uh, physiological um, effects that, that, that trauma and chronic stress can provide. So thinking about these things and how important it is to help uh, create opportunities for voice and choice, I'm curious, what do you do currently or what could you do in order to help promote a sense of agency for young people in your school systems? It's important for each of us to think about what we can do big and small to actually contribute to the help, the development of voice and choice. And we'll explore, explore more of that in the moment. This slide here really focuses on um, one framework for authentic youth engagement. Um, this was created by Annie E Foundation. Um, it's a document called A Framework for Effectively Partnering with Youth. And essentially they highlight four big pieces that are important to recognize um, when you're working toward creating authentic partnerships with youth. And one of them is to really make sure that um, when you're engaging with young people, that young people feel heard, that they feel like they're equal partners in, in um, the engagement, that they're respected, they're valued, trusted, and appreciated for their, um, what they're contributing, and that they're safe and comfortable to actually feel um, able and open to engage. When, whenever we focus, our, our authentic youth engagement not only helps young people build their self-esteem and leadership abilities, but it also helps them become better advocates. Um, it contributes to their professional development skills, and it also increases um, their ability to influence uh, not only their, their, their lives, but also their community. It can lead to young people being able to be well informed in decision making when they can um, when you when they're able to influence the practice and design of things. It helps cultivate trust between the adults and the youth and support the development of problem solving and leadership skills. But obviously, in order to do this well, it requires quite a bit of preparation. Um, whenever a young person's coming to the table to be in an advisory committee or be a part of a planning team, it's important that we're able to meet the youth where they're at and help them get where they could be. And so this requires a lot of time, may require a lot of time, patience, and skill. Um, oftentimes, informed decision making for young people means giving them what they need in order to be capable and helping them um, see what's possible for them. Um, this could be something as simple as providing an agenda and resources ahead of time so that they're kept in the loop of the information. And to really work with them in partnership to assess their readiness. Um, we don't want to make sure we're not uh, we're avoiding um, uh, tokenizing, but to help the young person become an equal partner by experiencing what that actually feels like to be an equal partner at a decision making table. Opportunity is one of the other big uh, elements of authentic youth engagement, and that really speaks to the ability to um, work together with the young person to identify, evaluate, and create opportunities that will help further their development. So we can consider the ways that this, um, whenever there's an opportunity for them to be a part of the planning and decision making or contributing, to really look at how this might actually meet their needs how this might help them enhance a skill, or really um, how this is, is in connected to their interests. And when it comes to support, it's not just physical support, like having a person there to help with logistics and being um, maybe being in the room, but it also involves um, providing emotional support, like that um, encouragement, um, especially encouragement to take the, to do self-care and really attend to their needs. Uh, both before the meeting and after, and, and even during. And emotional support could also look like uh, debriefing the meeting afterwards or debriefing the event. So that way you're able to hear and listen and attend to um, what's going on, what's happening for the young person. And finally, we offer financial support uh, is, a, is a big important piece as well. Um, compensation is a form of sharing power. 
And so whenever we can find resources, even if they're small, to offer, um, to offset some of the costs of their participation, like providing stipends for food um, and travel when they're in person, um, to provide um, compensation for tech, tech, technology access or tools. And for adults or young, sorry, young adults who are, um, or youth who are parenting, childcare is essential as well. And being able to make sure that we're paying folks for their time, showing that we value their experience and their contribution, especially when we're thinking about uh, public speaking. So one of the things that are really important in order to help support that authentic engagement really means spending time to reflect about what we can do better, like the initial question that Jen uh, shared, um, the reflection question earlier. Um, this is the definition of adultism that was offered by Marianne Garrison in a training called Engaging Youth on Their Own Behalf. And it says, uh, adult adultism is a word that refers to behaviors and attitudes based on the assumption that adults are better than young people and entitled to act upon people without their agreement. Another definition is system, a systematic uh, mistreatment and disrespect of young people. So these, when we think about this term, this in, in, the, in the context of our uh, youth adult partnerships, oftentimes what this might look like is um, adults assuming that young people aren't ready or um, whenever a young person contributes an idea out of context that might shut it down or steer the conversation away. And we'll talk more about um, some of the other pitfalls that could happen when we're engaging with youth. But we offer this definition really just to help you think about what are some ways that adultism might be playing out in your life? What are some ways that it might be impacting the way that you engage with young people? We know that many of us experience bias. It's a part of our, our brains and bodies. It's a thing that we all experience. And it's when those biases are tied to assumptions that we make and impacted by different stereotypes that we end up um, causing harm for, for folks. And for young people, it's important that we're mindful of um, how uh, this perception might be impacting our, our decision-making and the way that we engage with folks. So the next section we're talking about different things to keep in mind when we're like what it takes um, to really partner with youth and also um, what do we want to avoid. And so I invite Jen to, uh, to um, share different um, examples on how these elements might show up. Yeah. And so again, just inviting folks. I know we're in the post lunch kind of sugar crash maybe, I don't know, um, di rest and digest part of this. So inviting folks just to take a breath, back into our bodies, stretch, if that feels good for you. Thank you for interacting with us on the chat to make this as, as most embodied as we can. Um, yeah, so this is where we get into the part where we can talk about the messiness of this, right? we can be rigorous there is some science there is some scholarship around this um, but i think it's also constantly evolving in the invitation for us as adults around partnering at least i will speak for myself the invitation for myself um, i am somebody who also grew up in systems including juvenile justice systems and residential treatment and so but i will say that um, if, as you can see, I got a little gray hair now, so I'm a little older. I'm way into the adultism, right? Um, and as I've been more and more entrenched in systems, um, starting off, you know, at the bottom rungs and then climbing and, and then leading systems, I've just noticed, um, I've noticed just how much I need to constantly be detoxing detoxing, metabolizing, transforming the stories that I've been given about the worth of people, right? So that bias around adultism is real. It impacts all of us, even if we may have some system experience early on, right? So we're just gonna take some time to um, really lean into this. 
this is like lived experience here, I think, for myself and I know for Darren as well. So there are possibilities, there are promises, and there are also pitfalls. Um, and what does it mean? What does it sound like, look like? Um, what are the risks? I think this is the question I really want us to sort of lean into and think about. All of you on the call work, it sounds like a lot of you, or it looks like a lot of you are in school-based health programs um, or supporting, you're in CBOs, you're in, I see the Europe Tribe Education Department, Family First Health. So all of you are in the work, right? You're in the struggle, you're in the messiness. Um, so you all bring your own stories about possibilities and pitfalls. Um, we're gonna share a little bit about some just common pitfalls that you may have also experienced and just share our own messy learnings in this field. Um, this is about, again, um, for us to be in systems, the longer I've been in systems, whether it's been a grassroots organization or a large CBO or a big system like a Department of Public Health or a county system or a district or a school-based system, um, the more you are embedded into a system that is fairly highly coercive and controlling. And I say that about mental health. I'm a mental health therapist and I say about that about our mental health systems, right? We, we live and operate in these structures that are uh, fairly complex and oftentimes um, organized by crisis, right? Around crisis, maybe even hypervigilant or hyperreactive to crisis. Um, and so are generally concerned with things like threat reduction, right? <laughs> Compliance. Um, I notice in my own organization, sometimes our leadership under enough stress, we can become really overly concerned with compliance and control because we are in a crisis mode. Um, when, when really um, this work is about leaning toward risk, towards learning, towards what we can reimagine. So I just wanted to put that out there. So common pitfalls, tokenization. We hear this from young folks all the time, right? You wanna talk about youth engagement, but you don't listen. We speak, but you don't listen. And so, you know, again, this is, you want me to say what you want me to say, but you actually don't want to hear what I need to say. So tokenization can look like, it can take many different forms, wear many different costumes, um, but I think where I see it most prop up is in the struggle and the tension between, in our systems, we have a tendency to um, control time right? We live in a culture of urgency. Um, and so oftentimes, I think for young people who have, you know, called me into <laughs> my own behaviors of tokenization, it's like, okay, Jen, you're giving me 15 minutes um, for this half day meeting. This is feeling like you actually don't want to hear what I really have to say. You want me to just, you want to fit me into your agenda. So I think that that shows up, like we're most at risk of tokenization. Um, A, when we, are, um, when we are pressed for time, which we often are, so that's an ongoing struggle. I also think tokenization tends to show up when we are, um, when we are adding young people in as an afterthought. So oftentimes we work with school communities on commemoration and memorialization after a loss of a student. And it can feel like for students and young folks that they're, bringing, they're being brought in after the whole event has already been designed to help sort of be the face of it or to be a, play a performative role, right? So it looks like students were involved in co-leading this and co-hosting it, but they were never involved in the planning process from the get-go. So just a couple different examples of what tokenization can look like. I'm sure you, you all have many examples as well. But also just offering that we are, we are at risk of tokenization when we are pressed for time. And right, we are often pressed for time. So part of this, 
transforming the cultures and conditions that support student voice and leadership is around transforming our sense of time. Not easy, not easy, um, but just a lesson learned for me. I think that the other thing that we see quite frequently at Trauma Transformed is trauma story exploitation. Some people call it trauma porn. We didn't want to put that on a slide. Um, but trauma story exploitation, it's asking young folks to share their stories of harm, um, which is very different than sharing their stories of healing, their stories of leadership their stories of rigorous reimagination for our systems, their stories of advocacy, their stories of analysis. If we only go to students for their stories of harm and what they've been through, then we're really, really impoverishing this notion of student leadership and student partnership. And ultimately, I feel like we pay the, the price of that. Um, and yet, it continues to happen. Um, it continues to happen. So a pitfall to watch out for. Um, soliciting feedback with an action. So again, we hear from young folks all the time. I'm sick of being in your listening sessions. All you do is listen, but you don't do anything with what we say. So really, are you listening? So listening, not just as um, a passive action, but as an active, as an active um, advocacy, right? As an act of um, solidarity, as an act of, um, you know, the quote, which I'm not, hopefully I won't butcher too much, but like, you know, the liberation of others is bound up in my own liberation, right? And so, um, soliciting feedback with an action is a common pitfall. Um, again, thinking about the ways in which we're setting things up from the get-go and making sure that we are involving student leadership, not just in the they give us transactionally or performatively. Um, students give us information and then we go and make decisions about it, but in all all the links on this chain, right? In the preparation, in the design, in the, in the inquiry on what this is, in the thinking about how to implement the demands, the considerations, the recommendations that come forth, um, how to sustain it, right? Who leads it, who makes decisions, who reflects on it. We borrow a lot from youth participatory action resource research in this, right? So having youth involved and young people and student leadership involved in all aspects. And again, that goes back to the first one, right? Our press, our, our you know, the tension of time. So I just want to put that out. Um, a couple promises. Again, I think, you know, in my, and I'll try to be quick with this story, but I think that um, Darren and I both, um, were supporting a SAMHSA project for Trauma Transformed in 2015, 2016. And I learned a lot of hard lessons, right? A lot of hard lessons about my own adultism and about my own ways that I will slip into inadvertently and unconsciously um, and unintentionally, but still the impact is I've slipped into tokenization or performative um, behaviors. So we um, set up a youth and family advisory council. That was one of our deliverables on the grant, right? So to perform the deliverable, let's set this up. Um, and, you know, it was meant to be two separate advisory councils as part of this regional center. Um, you know, and the young people and the caregivers actually wanted to combine, combine the two advisory councils and had said, um, to us in very, in, in very, um, you know, concerned ways that, yes, there were legacies of youth leadership and youth advocacy, and yes, legacies of family and caregiver leadership and advocacy, and also the experience of families, adults, and young people, caregivers and young people going through stress and traumatic events together, but never having the opportunity to heal and lead and define healing together. 
or define system transformation and advocate together was a gap that they wanted to fill, right? And so again, I think what I want to say here is that in order to listen and take action based on that, we had to advocate with funders, we had to risk, we had to push funders to conceptualize this differently, we had to change the way we resourced you know, the group, we had to change the way we define the deliverables in the contract and do all of those necessary kind of system advocacy, all that necessary system advocacy work which takes more energy, which takes more time, which takes more work on the behalf of us as adults and providers to really act on what was given to us. Um, takes more risk, takes more uh, work. So again, just wanting to use that as an example. Um, I'm gonna stop here and see, <laughs> turn it over back over to Darren. Thank Not you. risk uh, talking too much. Those were great examples, and I appreciate you sharing, especially your insights. Um, when we speak about effective support, I think I want to spend a little more time unpacking that a bit, because um, effective support, in many ways, requires us to do that critical self-reflection and to really think about, um, you know, what we need in order to be resourced enough to be able to, to offer that support to young people. Um, that includes challenging our implicit biases, but it's not limited. Like, um, it's important that we adopt that perspective that young people are experts on their own experiences and see that young people are capable if we uh, give them the opportunity and support. Additionally, like effective support means that we have to be mindful of safety. It's so important that um, we, because there's power differentials between you know, students and, and uh, administrators or students and uh, faculty, that th it's really important that we're, we keep that in our mind when we're doing things like inviting them to participate or giving them direction um, or support. And when we think about safety from those different domains, um, physical, relational, emotional, and being able to understand the structure, what to expect, and so that involves doing things like preparing them ahead of time, checking in, um, giving them agenda, or inviting them to participate in setting meetings. Um, and I often think about uh, situational leadership and management, like one of those ideas, um, that we can't use the same approach all the time with young people. I think that one, many of the young people that I've worked with are used to adults giving them directions, being very directive. This is how you do things. This is how, I, we, how uh, we want this to be done as a process. But there's some times where young people are skilled enough or have enough awareness or have you know, so many other insights that maybe supporting them would be more effective or being able to offer coaching as an opportunity to ask them critical questions to think things out, uh, to help them gain deeper insights, or maybe even delegating things all together. And so we offer that just to, to consider what, what does effective support mean to this young person? And that sometimes involves just asking them, you know, what do you feel that you need right now in order to be successful? And sometimes those young people can offer really powerful responses that can help shift um, not just the way you work with that person, but maybe your practice altogether. Um, some of the other promises that are, are important to touch on, touch on is the relationship that you're developing with this youth, that reconnection. Um, that's possible uh, to be able to heal through those relationships they have with you. Um, being able to listen deeply, uh, offer co-regulation in those moments where they're stressed out, overwhelmed, and may behaving, maybe behaving in ways that you don't particularly enjoy. Um, if you have a trusting relationship, they're able to bounce back better and often sometimes quicker. Um, that helps you know build up their resiliency skills when um, they know that they can at least trust you to be a dependable person. In their life. So I think that, uh, was there anything you'd like to add about uh, post-traumatic growth healing? Um, I often think sometimes we look at this and we 
we're trained to think about this in terms of the promises for the young folks. But again, the post-traumatic growth is for us, right? Again, have that mirror, going back to that mirror and landscape metaphor. Um, so yeah, one of the promises, one of the possibilities is that we, we get to be on a learning and growth and transformational journey with young folks and we benefit from taking those risks um, that are hard you know it is hard to set down what you believe what stories and narratives you've been given to believe i know with that the many years that i've worked in schools i've been given lots of stories to believe i worked in predominantly you know um, special education settings non-public school settings um, where I was given to believe a lot of stories about um, our ability, so my ability and the classroom's ability, the students' ability to recover, to renew, to grow, to transform, right? I was given lots of narratives around, you know, this classroom, you just, you know, you're going to spend all day just, you know, getting them to comply chasing them around it's just crisis after crisis after crisis not a lot of learning happens in this classroom absolutely not true right and in, in fact i would often say that um, in in those types of environments i learned most about what it means to really recover deeply and to renew and to heal and to really understand the conditions and cultures that need to be transformed in our schools from those classrooms, right? From what happened in those classrooms, usually in the back, right? Trailers in the back. <laughs> Talk about conditions for <laughs> reestablishing safety and connection on a structural level. Um, but those students had the most profound um, and wise uh, recommendations and demands for school communities and, and lived experience and wisdom in terms of what it really takes to recover and heal after a big thing happens, after a big crisis happens. So again, just the post-traumatic growth and healing is about moving from chaos to cohesion, but more importantly, that's our sweet spot opportunity to learn from students about how we can reimagine the systems, the school communities that we need, even for our own ability as educators, principals, school-based behavioral therapists, um, to be in community, to grieve, to mourn, and to heal. Turn it over to you, Darren, or we can go to the next slide. So um, one of the things that um, one of our, co our community partners that works in collaboration with us, with SCRR, um, is called Youth Move. And they held um, a series of uh, listening sessions recently in May 2021. Um, we know that a, a significant number of youth and young adults are exposed to traumatic life events, including school-based school settings. And while crisis and disasters can't be entirely avoided, um, the consequences can be minimized if we use um, appropriate response recovery and renewal opportunities. Um, for school-based communities like this one, um, it's important that we accentuate or um, enhance our resilience and long-term healing. Um, young people must be adequately equipped in order to be able to process an event and receive that necessary support in order to recover. And so that includes attending to safety, giving them moments to remember and reflect, uh, to mourn and to reconnect. And that renewal portion is about attending to post-traumatic growth by helping them make meaning of the, of the crisis and heal. And so uh, Youth Moon Move embodied these ideas when they held these listening sessions, where they actually invited young people who are ages 18 to 24 who've experienced in the cri a crisis in their K-12 experience to come and share their thoughts and ideas. And so um, they asked these eight questions for young people. And essentially it was all on the topic of what might harm and what might help young people as they navigate through a school crisis. 
So firstly, they started off by defining what a crisis was and how they think that the administration defines it. What does it look like and feel like? And then they explored what helped and what harmed. Like, um, was this supportive? Who did you reach out to? Um, how can schools actually support you better in crisis? And um, what can communities do better and providers do better in order to support? And so this is what we learned. Rather, um, rather than uh, focusing on, on like a, a general definition, um, they partnered with the students and the alumni in order to create a shared definition of what crisis recovery and renewal would actually look like. And so they define crisis as um, something that impacts their day to day and keeps you from going about your life. Things that, help, that impact your mental and behavioral health without support. Um, whenever you're experiencing anything that's a negative impact on your development. And that they looked at development from multiple lenses, not just mental and emotional, but also physical, sorry, not just emotional and physical, but also mental and spiritual. And that the experience of crisis can be, be very individual. So what one person considers a crisis might be very different for another. They recognize that recovery isn't linear, um, but the supports that are needed need, need to be, supports need to be structured in that way. When thinking about what helps, um, there's this beautiful infographic that was created in order to help highlight some of the ideas and, and thoughts that young people have. So what helps, generally speaking, is people who treat you with love, who treat you as a person first, um, then being able to provide different outlets for folks to express their thoughts and ideas, like dance and art, um, being able to meditate, yoga, and, and doing new things, things that they may have not done before. So there's an opportunity for innovation there and fun. Um, receiving affirmations, feedback from folks that is positive. Being able to experience trust, empathy, and not being judged when they're expressing their feelings and thoughts. Um, having a safe space and a safe person. Um, so this talks about relational safety. Being able to work with the young person wherever they're at to help them get to where they could be. Is there anything you'd like to highlight, Jen? Um, yeah, I just want to highlight, I think young people, I don't, I don't know if you've hit this slide or talking point yet, but just young folks and students defining for themselves, what is crisis? What is response? What is recovery? What is renewal? So again, just even back at the beginning to the definition. Um, Yeah, they recognize that there's many resources that are already available to them, but many times they may not be aware. And so being able to be uh, able to share all the options can be helpful in helping young person decide what might best fit for them. Adverse on the other on the other end, um, we they shared also what what harms and the things that actually contribute undermine the healing process. And many of these things are listed here, like experiencing stigma, um, and isolation, not being able to open up sooner about what's happening and, and how they feel. Um, one of the big buckets of of uh, one of the big topics they focused on was people, family, and friends who didn't actually allow them to experience what they're feeling. You know, often when folks are experiencing grief and loss or big reactions to um, things that we may already be resourced enough to handle, it's, it's difficult for us to be patient and tolerant with their experience and just let them sit in those feelings. 
um, that we have feel compelled to do something, you know, to do something in order to help them feel better or help them solve the problem. And most often, that's not necessarily what's needed in the moment. Rather, what the young people are saying is that they just need someone to be there with them as they're feeling. So tell them that, it, that, that, that not telling them that everything has to be okay, to not pressure them to push through or um, feel better now. Some of the other things that um, harms is the red tape that administration can, can set up, the, the different barriers in order to, that undermines their ability to like, respond in more innovative ways. Also, retaliation from schools instead of support. And also for, for those folks who may be experiencing um, um, different layers of support at home, um, it's important that we're, we're aware of them. And one, one example is the immigrant parents who don't know how to help. Um, in those moments, it's important to ask those young people, like, what, what can help, what support? Also, when we're thinking about the, the resources that are available, um, what also doesn't, what the young people share harms is that when there are resources that are not by um, Black and Indigenous and people of color specific. They speak to the fact that for them, many, young, many of the therapists don't understand the unique intersection of um, their experience with who they are. What are thoughts are coming in for you, Jen? Yeah, and I just love to pop in and also mention that I think this is hard. You know, we talk about the pitfalls, but I have been, you know, I. I have been in many, many um, forums, listening sessions, engagement sessions, where um, you know it is. It can be really hard to listen to stories of harm about the system that you are in, and maybe even leading. So I've been in many, many listening sessions with young folks where they are talking about the systems um, with the system leaders in the room or about, for example, an agency that I may work with or schools. And you can see it. I can see it in myself. I can feel like the, bup, 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 you know, the like, uh, but I don't want this narrative to go unchecked because, uh, uh, you know, you can see it in leaders. Like we are trained, I think, um, to be responsive, right? And to problem solve or to fix or to correct. And honestly, the more proximity we have to power, we really are, you know, our impulse is to control rather to contribute. So I'll say that again. Maybe the more proximity we have to power, our impulse is to control rather to contribute and just listen and hold. And so I think that these are words on a screen. They're in a very beautiful um, shout out to Rio Holiday, who did the graphic recording for this session. It looks really beautiful and so much harder to do and practice in an embodied way. So actually where we see the most harm happen, it really gets in the way of, of student voice and student leadership is um, our absolute inability to really listen and to get out of the way. To listen and hold without going into fix it mode, without going into responsive mode, without going into let me check you on that fact because actually I can't have that go unresponded to because I might be facing litigation stress of some sort, right? This, this is stuff that happens, that comes up or going into immediate compliance mode. We can't do that because it's not the way we've done it. We won't get permission from the state. It's out of compliance with this policy or that policy instead of holding, listening, deeply considering what the need is that's driving it. So again, sounds easy, looks pretty on a graphic, 
really calls us into our own regulation. So again, going back to the theme of this conference around resilience, um, what is the, our self-regulation that we need to do as adults to counteract that bias of adultism that Darren talked about? And what is that work? Again, going back to our original question, what is it that that needs to heal and transform in myself so that I can embed these strategies into practice, right? So that I can truly partner in a deep, authentic, radically authentic way with young folks. And I'm getting lots of time messages, and I know we have some questions probably. So um, lastly, I'll just say, I just want to put, I'm going to put in the chat this beautiful quote that young people uh, gave to Ernest Morell. It's Ernest Morell's uh, YPAR work. So he had young people uh, define youth voice. And I just think this is really fascinating. I'm about to drop it in the chat because um, it's so different than how we normally see youth voice being defined. And I'll stop there. And, and I apologize. I was going to give these um, wonderful folks a 10 minute notice, but we're going to move into a Q&A session. And while people metabolize their lunches and their questions and what they've been hearing, I just wanted to um, first say so much of this is resonating with me, um, giving me a lot of pause and things to um, think about in terms of what keeps me from really truly listening to people, which I reflected on in the chat. But I thought it also might be helpful to hear from you both an example of a crisis that you helped advise on or, or um, work, work with an institution on where, you know, what happened and how did either your team or the leaders that you were, the folks that you were coaching respond and use youth voice to change what might have been their inherent response so that it was more renewing and re um, move toward re recovery more quickly. Or if it hasn't happened yet because of where you are, maybe you can um, do a hypothetical situation of how you think it might go. I'm happy to talk unless Darren, some things you have a burning desire to get in. I'll feel free. Okay. The one that's most vivid for me actually comes up around my work at Oakland Day Treatment, uh, which was a non-public school in, in Oakland Unified um, for, you know, what we call severely emotionally disturbed students, right? Um, I would also offer that we might be, you know, in severely emotionally disturbed systems, but that would be another workshop. Um, but, you know, working with those folks were, in, and this was a while back, but we were dismantling the, um, the quiet rooms, <laughs> another false narrative, right? The quiet rooms, the seclusion rooms that we were using. And so, um, again, this could be a whole other workshop, but I think that there was a vivid moment um, where you know we were not in agreement amongst ourselves as staff right some staff for it some staff against it some staff really feeling like this is going to make it more unsafe some staff feeling like this is a brutal practice and we need to end it yesterday um so there was disagreement among us but i think we never stopped to to consult we had a student leadership group right a student government group that we never consulted with on this, right? Major issue that impacts them the most. And so we had one of the one of the young students who said, um, you know, if you if y'all, you know, if y'all thinking about doing this, like we should know about it. Right? Which <laughs> was, you know, I mean, it, again, we were doing stuff for them, ostensibly for them, not not with them right we're doing stuff to them not with them so going back to darren's point so i think you know a slice of humble pie and also wow what does it mean for something that we're already grappling with as staff as providers as educators that's really kind of tender area for everyone's like you know hyper vigilance to safety um what does it mean to really co-lead 
taking out the seclusion rooms and working with students on reimagining what safety looks like, kind of maybe a timely topic, what safety really looks like, what safety really is, what regulation really is, um, and what interventions truly, truly support when students are in crisis. And they may be, um, they may be engaging in really harmful behaviors um, but what does it need to look like? How can it be reimagined? So um, I just think that that was a really vivid moment for me. And then really working with that student government team, <clears throat> you know, to enact their recommendations, which I didn't always agree with, right? The staff didn't always agree with. Um, and we had to really push, like I mentioned before, push our systems to really invest in some of these student generated solutions, even though, even though they don't look like your typical <laughs> solutions, right? So when at when when the student said, what are we going to turn the rooms into afterwards? Um, you know, they brought back some recommendations. They only had one recommendation, which was a bouncy room. An open, no door, door off the hinges, no locked, but a bouncy room. <clears throat> so, you know, you can imagine that like the educators, the teachers, the districts we were in partner with had a lot to say about that, right? <laughs> so all the maneuvering that you have to do and all the risk taking and all the like quieting, turning the volume down on what we think is right and really <clears throat> beginning to think through how can we support young folks in implementing these solutions um, and navigate these systems uh, with them, not for them, but with them as a moment of like shared advocacy and shared leadership. Um, and in doing so, that really pushed a lot of different um, tentacles of systems transformation and school leadership that we didn't even anticipate in the beginning, right? So sometimes it's just showing up for the struggle, just showing up for the struggle, showing up with young folks for the struggle, not worrying about whether it's going to be a win or lose situation, but seeing the value in the struggle. Thank you, Jen. I'm dying to know if the bouncy room happened, but I know that we are at 144 and you have some additional resources to share. So yeah, um, let's do that. Thanks. Yeah, Darren, can we go to the, in our final moments, I just want to invite folks. We are your school crisis recovery and renewal. Again, we are um, hoping to be, to, to really further our, expand our community with you all around inquiry. Um, around this inquiry about how do we recover and renew after a school crisis and also how do we do that with and for and not to uh, students. Um, and so we have some upcoming opportunities that may be of interest to folks here, Life After Lost Tables, the Educators Edition. Um, this is a project um, with the dinner party, so this is around grief. Um, we also have our Winter Institute coming up. So strategies for cultivating joy and wholeness, recovering from school th crisis through connection. Please, please, please sign up for our Winter Institute. It's going to be always the jam. And we just love, love, love being in community with you um, around practices, practical strategies, but also strategies that bring joy in this time of like grieving schools in a pandemic, right? We could all use a little shot of joy. And then next slide, please. We dropped some resources into the chat, but we have many more where that came from. So we talked about the Youth Move um, student-led um, leadership and crisis recovery. We also have an educator-centered uh, resource guide. We also have trauma-informed COVID-19 leadership practice guide for recovery and renewal, specifically for school leaders um, following a community of practice that we had last year and the 10 pillars of school crisis recovery and renewal. Please check it out, check us out. Our resources are great. And if you find something in the resources where you're like, oh, I wish I could understand that better or have some 
um, deeper help or connection with SERR and implementing that in my school community. Then the next slide. And I know we're almost at time or after time. Um, <clears throat> next slide. Next slide. Is um, join us, request TA, um, connect with us more deeply, sign up. Um, there is a link for getting involved. I will send out, we're going to send out all these resources that we dropped in the chat or before, but there is a link on our website where you can request TA for deeper partnership. Um, with your school community in all of these areas, if there's anything that pinged your interests that you want to be in a collective versus an isolated struggle or grapple with, we are here for that. We are here with you and just really invite you into our larger inquiry um, into this crisis recovery and renewal effort. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today in the post-lunch slump. Thank you for bringing your energy, your appreciation, your wisdom, and your struggle. And thank you, Darren, um, for being my co-collaborator um, and teacher. Frankly, my teacher in this area as well. And thank you, Tracy, for being the hostess with the mostest. Thank you, so much. Thank you Darren. Thank you, Darren, so much. Thanks, everybody. There's a mindful close with Lance McGee. So please um, head out to that section if you Lance. Like. You know Lance, and of course, hope yep. you can talk about a, a wellness um, MC with the mm -hmm. Thank totally. you, everyone. We're going to close out. Take care.